As you know, maximum pressure on Australia to join the rest of the world, signing up to a new climate deal. We already have the Paris one fully signed up and passed by the Parliament for 2030, but the pressure is on for a deal for 2050. Now, the Labor Party has dropped its 2030 targets because, of course, they've lost multiple elections. However, they have a 2050 target, which, of course, is net zero. Dave Sharma is amongst a collection of Labor, uh, Liberal MPs who've suggested that uh, they need to have a bolder target as well as taking on the uh, net zero 2050 position. For what it's worth, I think Australia would most likely end up signing up to that document, but the way the politics will play out is we've got a deal that takes us to 2030 and then we can have a deal that takes us from 2030 to 2050. To talk about that and a whole lot more, Tina McQueen, Senator James McGrath and from the Labor Party, Matt Thistlethwaite. Tina, let's start with you about uh, the schism that is always climate. Um, I think that we all agree that net zero 2050 in raw political terms is a never-never statement because clearly it is something that is the best part of 30 years away. However, we have places like the EU that are saying they would potentially put tariffs on Australia if we didn't sign the never-never agreement. So is the compromise, yes, the never-never agreement, but we know what the plan is between now and 2030 and it's not a floating price on carbon. Well, Paul, this is this is the uh, this is the issue that has dodged many elections, and we've won nearly every election since 2010 on our climate policies. But this is going to be very tricky for the Prime Minister. But when you look, I was just reading about Britain, where the um, electricity and gas prices are going through the roof, and they're heading for a catastrophic. Um, winter, as some have described. And I think we've got to have policies that generally suit a lot of electorates, not just single electorates like Wentworth and um, some other left-dominated electorates. We've got to be very careful because it's those marginal seats in the western suburbs and particularly in the, in the Hunter that we need to either maintain or win. So this is going to be very tricky to the Prime Minister. We can't upset our, our miners and the Hunter Valley, and we really don't want to annoy those in Wentworth. So, as usual, it's a very fine line, and the Prime Minister has a very sensible attitude towards climate change, and I'm sure he'll come up with something that will please everybody and not upset anybody too <laughs> yeah, much. Yeah, correct. No way. And climate, who would ever get annoyed at results there? But, James, isn't this the <laughs> ultimate workaround? You've got a plan till 2030. It doesn't involve taxes. It's about technology. Never Never is 2050. And rather than the coalition blowing itself up over the Never Never, you've got the plan for the next 10 years and Labor has its plan on a floating price on carbon and ETS. Exactly. We, we've got a plan... The plan is working. Uh, it's to reduce our, our 20, 20, 2005 target, uh, sorry, our 2005 levels by 26 to 28% by 2030. We're going to smash that because we're doing a sensible, boring, pragmatic, sober approach to, to climate emissions. That's what you want to see with a Prime Minister. We don't want to see ideology. We don't want to see taxes. And yes, there's going to be differences in the Liberal Party and in the National Party. But the thing is, whether it's Dave Sharma or George Christensen or whoever it is, they're not going to be Prime Minister. The choice is between ScoMo and Anthony Albanese. ScoMo with his sensible plan and Anthony Albanese, Anthony Albanese with goodness knows what he's got in his locker, but I suggest it's a giant tax. So we've got to remember this. Labor are going to tax people. They're not talking about it now. We've got a plan. It's working. Let's stick to the plan. Everybody just calm down and just focus on delivering the plan. Matt, uh, obviously, whether the coalition signs up to 2050 or not is going to be a big deal that Labor would make the most of at an upcoming election. But what about what I just talked about there about the political workaround, which is they've got a deal for 2030, so you can never, never to 2050? Well, we would welcome the government signing up to uh, net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, we'd like to think that Australia could approach this particular issue, which is a, a huge issue for not only our generation, but going to be a bigger issue for our kids, uh, on a bipartisan basis. And if we all agreed to net zero by 2050, that's the target that we work towards. And we work together cooperatively to try and achieve that and work on how we do that. Um, we all know that we're in a climate crisis. Uh, I had a briefing today about uh, the government's own Australian Climate Service and their predictions for this summer. They're predicting going to be hot. Uh, it's going to see uh, increasing risk of cyclone, increasing risk of flooding, increasing risk of bushfires. And Australians are paying for that, Paul. They may not realise it, but they're paying 
for it through their insurance premiums, particularly in in the north, in uh, James James's state, uh, where you struggle to get insurance around strata now, you struggle to get home and contents insurance. The government's actually had to step in and provide a reinsurance pool in the north of Australia to the tune of $10 billion because people can't get insurance. So this is costing Australians as it is at the moment because we're not doing enough and that cost gets greater and greater each year and we just pass it on to our kids. So Dave Sharma's suggestion is a welcome one. If we can work together on this on a bipartisan basis, we can stop weaponising this as a political issue and try and work together on it. Sure, but Matt, isn't the policy of Labor to have an ETS, a floating price on carbon, linked to the European price? That hasn't been walked away in all of the changes between 2016, 19 and 22. No, that's not our policy at all. We, we had a, an emissions trading scheme when we were in government. Uh, we lost the election in 2013 uh, and we ditched that policy. So uh, that's not in our policy mix. Uh, we've announced some policies around uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we've announced some policies around rewiring the grid to ensure that it can cater for the increase in renewables that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, we want to make sure that we boost renewables, that we have a target that we all work to, and we do it in the most efficient manner possible. And the best way to do that is to get a bipartisan agreement and try and work together on it. James, it's news to me. I'll trust me. Well, let's that bring it's not in nuclear. Let's, let's bring in nuclear. Well, yeah, what about that, Matt? Well, the issue with nuclear is... Let's where be you bipartisan on nuclear. Where are you going to put it, James? That's the issue. Um, and what do you do with the waste? And government hasn't solved that issue. Well, first yet. of all, wa uh, wa waste has been resolved. Where, where, where are you going to put waste it? Waste has been resolved. And, and what you do with the waste... OK, well, look, I'll, I'll take you on here. It was a Liberal National Government that, that has dealt with the issue of, of waste, and I give credit to, to Minister Pitt and former Minister Canavan for dealing with an issue that previous governments, including uh, Labor governments, failed to do with. So the issue of waste has been resolved. In, in terms of, of, of nuclear, let's have a discussion about nuclear, because the first thing you did, you went straight to the politics. You went to the politics of the scare campaign. Where's it going to, where's it's going to be? Well, let's talk about the benefits of nuclear. Let's talk about uh, the, the modern approach to, to nuclear energy with those small modular units. Let's have that conversation. But we can't have that conversation because Labor will always go to the scare campaign. No, you're welcome to have that conversation at, all, at any time. Um, but the, the fact is that the cost of renewable energy is coming down uh, by the day. It's actually much cheaper now than, than conventional energy sources. Um, and the problem with nuclear is we're looking at at least... You know, an eight to ten year time frame uh, before anything comes online. Uh, if the projections are right, then the cost of renewables with battery backup technology is going to be so much cheaper that it won't be efficient. But isn't the question though, and this is this this is again the multi billion dollar question. And Tina, this is my issue, right? I don't argue that climate change is real. You can't have seven billion people on the planet, multiple industrial revolutions without having an effect on the planet. But you have to be honest about the cost of transition. Now, I'm not verbaling what Matt just said, but often people who talk about the cost of uh, renewable energy being cheaper to uh, uh, coal, well, they leave out the billions of dollars required to physically build the windmill, physically build the solar, physically change the power grid which is exactly what's being discussed right now and playing out in Victoria, Tina. No, we lost Tina. But again, uh, James, that, that's my point, which is I don't mind an honest discussion. If Australia decided, you know what, we're all in, let's go, it'll cost $60 billion, $100 billion. OK, cool, we know up front. Instead, we only talk about it as if the uh, technology magically grew somewhere, didn't cost a dollar to create, and then we're just comparing um, you know, apples and bars of chocolate in terms of uh, energy, uh, uh, the, the, cost, the cost once those things are built. Oh, 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 totally. And we fail to take into account the, the costs that we're unaware of in terms of especially some of these uh, renewables. And look, oh, I'm agnostic when it comes to energy. I'm like most people. I just want to put on my TV, uh, I want it to work, and I want my electricity bill not to bankrupt me. And the trouble with renewables is there is a huge amount of government subsidies, and I'm one of these boring old fiscal conservatives. There's not too many of us left in this country at the moment, but I, I see myself as the guardian of the taxpayers' money, and there are billions of dollars being put in into the renewable uh, market at the moment. Uh, and I want to make sure we have a conversation about renewables, about nuclear, about what we can do with coal. But the issue about, about 2050 is everybody can sign up to 2050. But as you said earlier before, Paul, 
that's in 30 years' time. You and I can both sign up, and I've said this before, to lose weight. But while I'm going around hoovering up Tim Tams and mint slices uh, instead of getting on, you know, on, on the exercise bike and eating disgusting, you know, protein bars or whatever it is, nothing's going to happen. You've got to have a plan, and you've got to make sure to be aware of the costs of the plan. And as, Paul, as a senator from just... a, a cold state. Yeah. Can I just add, James, in the electorate, I mean, you can have these discussions with the Liberal Labor and bipartisan deals and all that, but I can tell you, people have had it very tough in New South Wales, Victoria, with COVID. A lot of them have been out for work for a long, a long time. All they care about is their electricity bills and that in the hot summer they can put their air conditioner on. We have to keep it simple and keep the prices yeah. down. That's, you know, that's the basic yeah, yeah. of it. That's the premise. Most electors aren't interested in all that high-tech shit. They just want the basic, give me the cheapest prices you can, and if coal will do that, let me keep my job in the Hunter Valley and let's keep coal in the mix. Matt? Well, the, the fact is that the prices are coming down. You're right, Paul, that there is the initial uh, establishment cost, and that, that is there for, for wind farms, it's there for solar. Um, but if you look at... Once they're established, the great difference with conventional energy sources is that the fuel is free. You don't need to pay for sunlight and you don't need to pay for wind. So those projects that were initiated 10, 8 years ago are now starting to turn pretty good profits and are much cheaper than coal-fired power because, oh, you have to continue to pay for the fuel. And it's now a fact that in the Australian energy market um, that those big solar projects are feeding in at a cheaper rate than coal because the cost is coming down. You look at the average household. If you went back, say, 10 years ago, putting solar panels on the roof probably didn't stack up financially over the life of those panels. But the cost of the panels has becoming, been coming down so greatly that now if you put solar panels on your roof, you're better off compared to conventional electricity through coal-fired power because they're so much cheaper and because you can actually feed back into the grid and make some money out of Which, it as well. So, this is becoming a cheaper energy source. 